All right, everybody, thank you so much for being here. This panel is Being Black in Game Audio. So despite a public commitment to diversity and inclusivity, Black people are very underrepresented in our industry, in our game industry. And in this panel, we're going to hear from Black audio designers of various levels of experience and various disciplines about their experiences, about their problems, about the struggles, and about their thoughts on how we can all create a more diverse and more inclusive and more empathetic industry. So a huge thank you to GDC for allowing this to happen because this message does need to get out there. We do need to share these experiences more and more. And a huge thank you to each and every one of our panelists. So before we get into this for all of our panelists, just when I ask a question, feel free to answer wherever you feel comfortable answering, because some of these questions, you know, will be heavy, some will be lighter. Jump in wherever you feel is appropriate for you. I do have some questions specific to each of you. Feel free to jump in, though, wherever in just general questions. So let's get into some introductions for all of you. First up is John Hamilton Smith V, AKA Slide 20XX. And John Hamilton Smith V or Slide 20XX is a composer who's worked on projects such as Calico, the Steven Universe Anti-Racism PSAs, The Stars Between Us, and has even written some music for the hit VR game Rec Room. Next up, we have Wilbert Roger II, composer for Mortal Kombat 11, Star Wars Vader Immortal, Guild Wars 2, I Knew the Distant Light, Call of Duty World War II, Destiny 2 Forsaken, and I'm sure so, so many more credits that I am forgetting at, the, at this moment. Next up is Caleb Epps, who is the audio director at Brass Lion Entertainment, a studio focused on telling stories for, uh, who are Black, Brown, or traditionally marginalized. He was also the sound design manager at Facebook, senior sound designer at Sledgehammer, and audio lead and sound designer at Harmonix. And last up, but not least, is Jasmine Cooper, who is a multimedia composer running her company, Perennial Sounds, based out of Vietnam, which offers both bespoke and licensed music for media projects of all types. And me, my name is Akash Thakar, and I'll be moderating this panel. So the first kind of topic that I want to dive in with all of you is networking while Black. So this industry is so focused on networking, on making friends, on working with people that you've met in some capacity before. It's very, very common in this field. So I'm curious, just as a broad starting point, what should game audio folks be aware of when it comes to networking, making friends, finding those projects while Black? So I feel like kind of something that I kind of want to start with is actually it's it's a it's kind of an anecdote. So I remember I was in San Francisco and I desperately needed to get a haircut, which has repeated itself, but I digress. Uh, I was in San Francisco and I went to this barber shop and it wasn't like if I'm if I'm telling the honest truth, I think it was a barber shop that may have like specifically catered to members of the LGBT community, but for whatever reason, they were playing like uncensored hip hop classics from the 90s that I grew up with. So I was in this barbershop getting this haircut and I got to experience this sense of like feeling like I really belonged in this public's place because it was catering to like my own personal interest. And in general, that is a thing that does not happen in the spaces that I'm participating in, like in classical music spaces, in video game music spaces, in tech heavy spaces, right? Like I've learned to navigate these places like in a way that does feel authentic to me, but that authenticity, that authenticity, excuse me, is not like super connected to the more like, I don't know, I'm not, I guess my blackest self in many of these spaces, <laughs> if that makes any sense. It absolutely does. I mean, um, I think we can almost all agree that like, you almost get a feeling like you have to prove that you belong there in a weird sort of way, like it's almost like an assumption is made of like, what is this person doing here? Uh, and, and just from my own experience, I mean, not to whatever, but like it took me maybe like three different multi-billion dollar franchises before I felt comfortable just walking into any game dev meetup and not feeling like I had to just constantly prove, no, 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 I belong here. I, I, I've, I've done work, please trust me, trust me, trust me. Um, you know, as compared to someone who looks more like the stereotype of, Oh yes, this person certainly is in, in game audio. Um, 
and I don't think, once again, I don't think that anyone intentionally tries to try to keep you out necessarily, but it's just that um, since prejudices do exist, um, it just kind of congeals into this sort of standoffishness, which is very difficult to combat. Yeah, and in terms of sort of thinking about, okay, well, how do you go about approaching that? Let's say you're someone who's starting out in the industry. How do you think about networking? Um, since it's such, as you said, Akash, it's like such an important part of, of making your way and making your career. Um, I think my advice would be, at least my journey has just been like, you know, find <laughs> my first GDC. I like stepped into this room with like all of the black people who make video games. Um, and, you know, there were not that many other audio folks there. Um, I think one thing that I would suggest is to is to maybe have sort of a dual pronged approach, find spaces where you feel, as John was saying, where you can be your authentic authentic self that sort of feels like a little bit trite but like it's it's a good good way of encapsulating that feeling of being able to bring all your your lived experience to to a space and then i think you you need to then fork that with with like find find your audio community too um and you know the the uh the sort of uh, underrepresented groups uh, are like getting bigger inside of audio, but it's still such a small amount of people that it's hard to build a a large enough space where it feels like something that you can move through and something that you can, you know, find your peeps inside that space. Um, and so I think that would be probably my advice is that maybe you kind of have to, to kind of to fork those efforts a little bit, but Jasmine, what's been your experience? Sorry, I started moderating. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. <laughs> um, so I guess my experience as far as networking, majority of, I guess, the relationships I've built have been online. The only, the only event that I've gone to was GDC, and that was before I came out here to an area of the world where there isn't a lot going on, but there is a lot of opportunity to create spaces. And I know for one thing with networking, sometimes that's what you have to do. For example, if you're new into the industry, game jams are perfect. You can, you're instantly catapulted into spaces where you're having to create something with different people. Well, the more you do that, the more you will meet people who will go off to make games and you'll have that connection that you can tie yourself into. But also in lieu of that, you can def you'll definitely find people that are into games that are from a diverse background. I know the last game jam that I did, it was me. I had um, another guy on my team. I think he was Brazilian. And then I had a woman on my team who was from um, the Philippines. So straight out the gate. I mean, it wasn't planned, but we ended up having a very diverse team. But I think sometimes you do have to create your own space mm -hmm. rather than trying to wait for a space to embrace you. But I'll also say with networking, a lot of the time, doubt is superseded if your work speaks, speaks for itself. So like put your put your all into your work so that way if somebody does doubt you, all you have to do is just slide them a demo and say, oh, you doubt me, sir. Okay, have a listen. <laughs> and, then, and then it gets eradicated. So sometimes that's what you have to do too because that doubt will come. It will rise to the surface. But if you do good work or you put effort into what you do, then who you who you are or what you look like is going to get, there's a, it'll get thrown out the door to some degree because, you know, you know what you're doing. So I guess that mm -hmm. that's what I would say, like, let your work speak for itself and then create spaces if you feel like you can't find one that you feel comfortable in. I like that. I like that. So starting in 2020, the kind of black struggles or experiences and issues have become, you know, more and more prevalent, at least, especially in mainstream media, right? It started to trend on social media. It became more and more obvious to people who don't pay attention to that stuff, what's really been going on. And now we're in 2021 and it so often happens, you know, things move on, the news cycle changes, people focus on different things. So I'm curious between 2020 and 2021, how have your lives and kind of careers changed 
has there been kind of a groundswell of support for you and then it kind of died away? Is it still kind of staying? So like, is the support still kind of staying? What have you noticed in terms of all of that, those trends, that social media, that mainstream media, and how has that support you received changed your careers, if it has at all? I'm listening, yeah. I'm just writing notes because I forget stuff, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can, I can start us off again. Uh, so, Ah, so it... <laughs> uh, so 2020, you know, the, it's, it's odd, it's weird, it's still strange for me to talk about, but it was a complete like career explosion for me, right? Like people that I had worked with before reached out to me, people that were like kind of thinking about working with me were like, oh, I'm going to work with you now, which like one of the people I'm thinking about is like a great friend of mine. So this is not like, I'm not throwing shade or anything like that, but, um, and then there were, you know, opportunities that were a real direct result of everything that was happening, like my getting to work on the anti-racism PSAs um, for Steven Universe. So there, there has definitely been a, uh, a shift, I would say, like all of that, that explosion of things and that groundswell, like that is not around in the same way that it was which, you know, I have feelings about, and that's a bit disappointing, but I will say that on a positive note, like, I think being able to do things like this panel, I think, honestly, having the opportunity to even say something to anyone, like, these are things that I was never going to talk about, right? Because, like, who's, I mean, I, I hate to be cynical, but, like, who's going to give you a job if you're like, eh, you know what I mean? <laughs> so... Being able to have that openness, I think, does feel like a huge change, you know? I think there are like certainly, there's certainly a sense that there are people maybe kind of more established in their careers who are like much more optimistic about speaking with me than maybe they would have, wouldn't have been in the past that are like kind of, this feels kind of weird to say as well, but I feel like people are kind of trying to correct and like that is continuing to have an effect on my career. So that is a positive thing. What do you mean by trying to correct? I mean, like, so there's this great picture I remember seeing that I'm, I don't know why I'm going to try to describe a picture, but it's a picture about equality versus equity, right? And it's a picture oh, of that. like, oh yeah, with the fence and the boxes. All right, I'll still describe it that way. Yeah. So it's like two people are trying to look over a fence and they're like both kind of shorter than the fence. And so equality is like, they both are given like one box but like one person with one box can see over the fence and the other person is too short. So with one box, they still can't see. Whereas equity is like, oh, you give the person who's like shorter more boxes so that they can both see over the fence, right? And I feel like there is a sense that we're maybe at the very beginnings of like starting to work towards equity in this space, okay. I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I could give my Thank perspective as, as someone who's in-house. Um, and I've been in-house my whole career. Um, I think, I do think, John, that I agree with you that when, for example, you're looking into hiring, the the idea of sort of stopping the line and saying, hey, do we have a diverse slate of candidates for this position is now like acceptable, right? Like people get that and are willing to make space for that. And so, as you had mentioned, John, right, like, like there was this reaction, right, of, of this like enormous groundswell of opportunity and inclusion and people actively reaching out to say like, whoa, like, like, who are the, who are the black folks in this space? Let's like, let's, let's figure out who they are and lift them up, right? Um, I think that there is, but that muscle has, you know, relaxed, as you said, um, and that sort of groundswell of opportunity is not there, but I do think that there's some amount of memory there and some amount of structural change. Like, is it as much as, as we, as sort of where the pendulum was last year? No, but is there, is there a sort of positive systemic change that comes from that? I think yes. Um, but it's, you know, in the end, it's smaller than we would like. Um, I speak with the royal we of like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, right? um, but but it's it is it is like it's a change, um, and I think folks are 
folks are just generally more receptive to to under to sort of understand uh, other groups groups perspectives and and to sort of empathize with the experience of those groups going through the processes that they've built inside of a company and and sort of are looking to change those yeah i've definitely seen um some very positive outreach as well uh, amongst recruiters and people who are looking to either hire black talent or to at least just uplift them and then you know, have Twitter threads and say, here are our black creators, check them out. Um, and even if that has certainly slowed down um, in 2021, which by the way, I don't think it necessarily has in the terms of the recruiters. I've definitely seen uh, impressively uh, some recruiters from certain publishers doing a great job of making sure to find black spaces like the um, black and gaming uh, Facebook groups and, and other um, spaces to find creators. Um, I definitely would say that it's also partially on us to continue and take you know, whatever momentum was generated in 2020 to see if we can take the baton and go from there. Um, and and from, from my experience, I've definitely found so many wonderfully talented people in the past uh, year and a half or so. Um, partially because of groups like Black and Game Audio, like Discord group that John started and, um, and also Composer Diversity Collective and, and just kind of seeing people out there in the wild of, of Twitter and Facebook, and maybe they're on some mega thread, maybe I just happen to see them, uh, but I take note of them. And I, I just realize, okay, well, hey, here's a group of people. Maybe it's on me as well to hire black talent, yep. uh, to hire other forms of underprivileged talent, underrepresented talent, and see whatever little power that I have, which isn't great, but it's, it's enough um, to uplift them and help. And I think that um, I'm not alone in that regard. Um, so my, my outlook is actually still rather positive, even if it's on the surface does seem like the, uh, the 2020 momentum has slowed. Yeah, I would agree, Will. Like there's, I, I felt as part, of, as part of the last year, a sort of weight of responsibility um, yeah. that I hadn't really felt before. Like I'm, in the games, in the game scheme of things, I'm like getting old now, <laughs> um, and so I'm like, uh, and so I felt like, okay, yeah, there's a huge opportunity, but there's a huge amount of work to do, right? To build organizations in order to to structuralize, um, making the change that we want to see, um, and so yeah, there's been a. a a sort of groundswell, at least in sort of my realm of things, a groundswell of organizational work. I started a thing called the Game Audio Diversity Alliance, like to give yeah. scholarships out to out to kids. And then, Will, you've been involved in one that's run run out of gang, right? Um, and uh, so I think like that's sort of another space of opportunity that I saw open up was like, oh yeah, let's build these organizations that can that can be black and like, or diversely owned and operated um, in order to, in order to make structural change. And I agree with what you said, Will, especially about the onus being on us also. I, I think I'll talk about 2020 after this, but I will say 2021, I, I think it has made for those of us who do want to try and push the envelope in terms to incorporating black talent into our work, it has made it easier for us to do that, depending on who we're working with. I know one of the projects that I'm on, I have a really, really huge goal that I want to meet with this project. And I honestly did well, just what I wanted, I want at least 90% of the musicians that I hired to be black or people of color. And I had planned to do this and never told the developer. And we actually, um, I don't know if that's a good thing, but I was just like, you know what? I'm just gonna do it. And then- I'll just do it. <laughs> but well, I, mean, I, was, I was gonna do it, but I was like, I mean, whatever, I'm doing, I'm a, music, I'm a composer, whatever. But we had a face-to-face, -face, we had a meeting, one-on-one -on -one meeting, he was doing this with everybody. And he literally asked the question, is there anything that you have like aspirations for in this project that you, that you know that you would like to discuss, and I told him, and he was like, "Yo, I am 100% for this." And I was like, "I mean, it doesn't matter if you weren't, but <laughs> I'm glad that you are. I'm like, like, I'm glad that you are." But it's, I guess, it's just the fact that 
with this particular with, with this company, I felt comfortable enough to say, I want to do this. Mm-hmm. And a good part of me felt like they would be for it. And he was. So it's just knowing that we're in a space now where we could do that. We're just like, you know what? I want this type of, I want these people being a huge conglomerate of what I'm working with. And, you know, the people that I'm working for are like, you know what? I, I totally, I totally get it. You know, doesn't, I'm here for it. So that's nice. But in 2020, I think I'm, I was definitely one of the ones who was extremely skeptical um, of people who were reaching out. I didn't, nothing really changed for me. What I did notice was a lot of focus being put on to, you know, like, hey, I have this job. If you're black, please, you know, apply. And I'm one of those people where when I see that, I get irritated. Like you can just say diverse applicants can apply or, you know, or just, just say I have a job and go for it. But, you know, I understand that other people might like seeing that wording put on a job application, but I know for me, I just, as soon as I see that, I'm just like, I don't, I just, I just, I don't want to do it. And that's probably because a, a bit of it felt performative for me. I know, um, I know there are some people, other, there were some composers like offering services, like, Hey, if like, if you're black or you're marginalized, like, I want to give you, you know, help. I want to help you out. And that frustrated me too. Cause my thought process is we've been going through this for years and now you want to offer your services now when, you know, you can kind of, it can add to the clout that you can get on social media. It's, it, it's, it's one of those things where we know it's been happening for forever. So why are you offering your hand now when it feels as though socially it's accepted and exalted if you do that but i am i am happy that it has led to opportunities and things that have been exposing themselves now in 2021 so i'm happy i'm happy about it now that's all i got (laughs) yeah uh, you brought up a really good point jasmine about that kind of performative activism that can happen during situations like this it It tends to be a thing where I I imagine, and you tell me what you feel, does it sometimes feel that you can tell when it's performative and when it's not? Can you kind of see through it? Is it the sort of thing where you know, like, okay, come on. And how do you kind of deal with that sort of coming up? I think for me, at least with me, at least in that, I think in that realm, it's like you lose either way because you have people like me who are just like, ugh. I can't stand it when they do that. But you have other people who are just like, I love it when they, so it's, you really just kind of, you have to do what your heart feels like is the correct thing because whoever feels inspired to apply or join into it, they'll do it. And that's just from a surface level perspective of it. Once you're actually in the throes of, like when you're actually in the environment with those people, then you start to understand, ah, y'all are just all show. So I think as far as a job application, you can't really tell. But when you start talking to people, you start voicing ideas and you start hearing how, you know, they act whenever you might make a comment about something that they said or something that they might have alluded to. And then you start to see if they're open to being corrected or if they start breaking down and getting defensive in certain ways, then you start to see, okay, I don't think this environment is what they made it out to be if they intended on it being um, an environment that's inclusive. Right. I think it's a difference between an, a group or organization saying, hey, we want to come to you on your terms rather than, mm-hmm. hey, will you come to us on our terms? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it's it differs from place to place. But I think like in the core, that's that is maybe the difference between like performative outreach and and uh, and actual outreach. Yeah, I I would definitely agree with that. Um, yeah, and I, so I kind of feel, I feel two ways about it, right? Like on one hand, it's even, honestly, I've kind of noticed this performative thing probably less in my professional life, like a little bit in my professional life, but I have really noticed it in my personal life a little bit too, actually, where people are like, hey, if you need anything, just let me know. And it's like, oh, great. And, you know, there are a couple of people where I had like, you know, one or two good conversations, but then they were kind of back to like business as usual, back to their lives, back to, you know, whatever they were doing. And that along with some of the professional opportunities that have kind of like, you know, been that way can 
honestly be deeply upsetting. So that is part of it. Like I'm feeling a little upset talking about it. But then on the other hand, uh, if you'll excuse my phrasing, like a check's a check. Like I have to, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, I hate to, I hate to be that person, but it's like, I, you know, I've been wanting to do this since I was a child and mm. I made the decision that I was going to do it, whatever it takes. So like sometimes, so you walk into a room and like, I try to be optimistic. Like I go in and I'm positive. And I'm like, yeah, we're going to do this. It's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. You know, like whatever doubt I might have, I just ignore it. I put it to the side and I'm like, let's do this. And then, you know, maybe like five weeks later, I'm like, okay, I see. I see how this is going to be. But I'm also like, but I got paid and I'm making some music or I'm trying to make some music or I'm trying to make game, which was the point in the first place. So you, you have a few deep sighs and then get on with it, I guess. Oh, there's one of them. <laughs> I need to be more like that. I, I gotta work on it. I'm I'm just like if I'm just like I I ain't got time. Life's too short. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we were talking earlier about kind of that feeling like you belong in a space. John, I think you're the one who brought it up. You went to that barber shop and you're like, oh I I feel good here. I feel like yeah. I belong. Do you feel in the kind of broader industry as a whole, when you walk into a room that just can, you know, anyone's welcome. It's probably predominantly white if you're in the Western kind of world, especially. Do you feel that you have to kind of filter yourselves or kind of act a certain way to fit in? Do you, do you feel that that comes up? You know, I, I <laughs> used to go to a lot of meetups, especially here in, in Seattle. Um, which again, you know, I'm not trying to say anything negative. I mean, I think that Seattle has probably the greatest game audio community in the world. Um, however, before every meetup I went to, it was a very lengthy and surprisingly agonizing process of just going in front of the mirror, trying this outfit, that outfit, this one, that other, Aww. constantly trying mm -hmm. to figure out like, okay, I I'm a little, you know, a little more physical than most people. How do I sort of minimize the, the scariness of my appearance? Really? Wow. How do I soften my appearance to look more acceptable in this in this group of uh, you know professional nerds and, and stuff? And, <laughs> you know, I, I'm trying to be a, a softer it, nerd. But, I think that's cute. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's true. And I, I mean, I spent a truly agonizing amount of time uh, worrying about this. And then when I get there, you have to sort of like, okay, keep your voice down and then you da, 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 and, and speak with this sort of whatever, um, especially early on. Um, I mean, as, as time wore on and, and I befriended more people in the game audio community. So it wasn't like, here's a room full of people I don't know, but instead it's like, here's a room full of people, 90% of them I know and have befriended and they know already what my credits and whatnot are. Then it's like, okay, now you can relax. But honestly, I, I don't want anyone else to have to go through all of that. Mm. Um, and that's kind of where, where my headspace has been the last um, several years. I've been incredibly lucky and I admit to that freely. Um, it's, it's unusual um, for someone in our situation to have had the, the level of, of success that I, I'm very happy to have and very grateful uh, to have enjoyed, but I don't want anyone else to have to go through just rewriting yourself just to be accepted, just so that someone can listen to you and not just assume, oh, he's some fly by night operation that's gonna try to put hip hop in our games and you know, things, things like that, these assumptions um, that unfortunately are, are a reality for us. But what if we wanted to put hip hop in our games? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Exactly. Yeah. That, and that's that's another part of it is the diversity of the content itself. I mean, I happen yeah. to be, um, you know, more into like the world music orchestral world and stuff, which is, um, you know, it's it's an acceptable genre for pretty much any genre of games. But why don't we have more Spider-Man Miles Morales? You know, why don't we have more titles that blend different genres that typically aren't aren't heard anymore? And I think now is the perfect time to do it. I haven't been in like I said before I haven't been in any I haven't been in many spaces and so I haven't 
really felt the need to filter filter myself primarily because of that. Mm. Um, and then I don't know when I went to GDC, I felt more like an observer anyway. So I don't know if that changes how I might see myself, but um, I'm trying to think. I mean, I don't, I don't think I filter myself really. Or yeah, I don't think I've needed to, I don't think I've been in positions like Will to need to filter myself since majority of my career spawned online. So I could literally be myself anyway since I was technically anonymous. And um, so that I guess that worked out for, for me. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm a biracial kid. So like I've been code switching literally my entire life. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's something do you just sort of I've I've been thinking a lot about like oh, I just don't realize that I do it you know oh. um and especially sort of my journey through games I started at Harmonix which is a place that at the time and still is was just like rock culture right like it is just like um and so I you know put that part of myself away when I was at work um and you know the part that grew up on like you know listening to hip-hop and like and being part of the sort of part of myself that is steeped in black culture of like the 90s and early 2000s and um and <clears throat> so you do it without thinking like you you lean more into the into the part of yourself that loves games right and you lean you lean more into the the culture that you know is shared in those spaces oh. right mm, um and that that makes you know people feel more safe and you therefore more acceptable and um but unwittingly you're like you're you're hiding away a part of yourself that you without thinking don't think is safe to show right oh. and so that's sort of the that's the beauty of like inclusive spaces, right? You can, is it like you can dust off and, and excavate that part of yourself that you didn't realize you weren't using for the past, you know, 15 years or whatever, um, and rediscover it. Um, yep. Yeah. That's Stand ups at Brass Lion are like, are wildly different. Like <laughs> I'm bringing out all the old references and it's, it's great. Um, but yeah, I didn't realize I wasn't doing it for for the you know the rest of my career. John, did you have something to add? Yep, is what I added. It's exactly that, <laughs> honestly, all of that. I couldn't have said it better myself. Awesome. Yeah, and Will, you just brought up the interesting thought of genres in when it comes to music, especially. Have you ever run into the issue for any of you where someone expects you? to do a certain genre based on your race. They'll, they'll just assume that maybe you do traditionally black music and just be surprised when you don't. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's, it's understandable, especially um, if you just don't have any experience at all with people, um, people of color, then it's like, okay, sure, you have your stereotypes, I mean, I've definitely gone to, I don't mean to, I, I feel like I'm bad cop. Why do I always have to deliver like the negative? What is this? Is this a setup all along? What is this? <laughs> but yeah, you know, I've, I've been to, to GDC. You know, you have the nice little conversation circles, West third floor. And, you know, people are getting to know each other and someone's asking, oh, what musical genres do you all write in? And everyone kind of goes in the circle explaining, gets to me. And the person just says, oh, so I guess you do hip hop, right? And at the time I was working at LucasArts. So I had this LucasArts badge that literally said LucasArts <laughs> right there. And I'd already uh, introduced myself as, you know, that as such. So I said, no, you know, I mostly do orchestral, you know, Star Wars, you know, I've done some Star Wars stuff. And then they just went, okay, so like jazz? And to which I just said, <laughs> oh. yeah, sure. <laughs> For me, the, the conversation at that point was kind of. Over. I love how for him, 
black orchestra is jazz. Like, oh, orchestra oh has to be jazz. That's what she means. <laughs> <laughs> it is absolutely what it is. You know, and, and, oh. But just like Jasmine mentioned earlier, your work has to speak for itself. Uh, uh, and I think more than you know, every every black parent tells their kids, "Look, you have to work twice as hard. You have to yeah. shine like crazy. You have to work super hard at your work, because um, in order to be taken seriously, it has to just be that much. You know, it has to achieve that much. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's funny <laughs> when they make these assumptions about me just because of you know whatever." But uh, I, after a while, um, if you keep at it and keep sort of improving yourself, have that humility to be extremely self-critical about your work, um, then these kind of issues go away and it just becomes hilarious when they make that assumption about you. I was curious, Will, like what, what was your experience when you were approaching the score for MK, which is... Uh, like sort of leaning at, as sort of mainstream video games go has sort of some amount of Venn diagram overlap with black culture. Um, yeah. Like yeah. what was that experience like? You've just warmed my heart because I didn't think anyone would notice that. <laughs> I genuinely <laughs> didn't think, anything. but actually I, I'll, I'll, I'll explain it. It was actually quite intentional. There's a whole faction in the game of, um, I mean, they're earth realmers, but they're pretty much all American. Like Sonia, Jackie, Jax, um, Cassie, Johnny Cage. And I, immediately I, I saw this faction and I said to myself, I want to write a theme for this faction that embraces Black culture, that embraces spirituals. And it has that kind of pentatonic melody that you would expect from, from spirituals. And, uh, you know, I hired a, a, an amazing soul singer for this one scene with um, Johnny, Cassie, and, and Jackie. And, uh, you know, she knocked it out of the park, obviously, she's amazing. And it was very important to me that I had kind of two sides to it. One was to show, yes, this is the American sound. You can't divorce black music from American music, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to show this is the American sound to kind of portray the characters. Um, but also another kind of um, nuance to it, uh, which is another reason why I'm so glad that you brought this up was that um, there was a military heroism in it as well. And just like that, you cannot dissociate the Black experience from the military and American military history as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I had that sort of military pride in there um, in certain moments with, moments with Jax and Jackie, showing that they're a military family, they have a lot of pride, um, and they're also Black characters. And uh, yeah, I mean, I felt just so blessed to be on that project. The audio directors were extremely open to all of my ideas. And uh, it was it was a great opportunity to sort of. I don't think we've ever really had spirituals <laughs> in a video no. game, uh, or yeah. or soul singing or anything like that. I mean, I could be wrong, you know. Excuse me if I am, but um, it was a fantastic opportunity to bring that to the forefront. Yes, I love that, Caleb. Thank you for asking that. That's awesome. Yes, thank you. Uh, sorry, I'll, I'll stop <laughs> no, that wasn't a plan. I didn't tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, uh, I might as well I might as well ask my uh, question for you, you Caleb. I'll put you in the spotlight for a second. Okay. Uh, so you are an audio director of color. There there aren't very many of those in the Western kind of game industry at all. I can maybe <laughs> count on one hand off the top of my head the amount that there are. So I'm curious what kind of discussions or thought process thought processes you uh that you can have now that you are an audio director of color that you couldn't maybe at previous companies or kind of previous spaces that you've been in Ooh, big question um well i think the uh, i think the sort of most obvious one is around hiring right and team building um you know uh, both as an audio director sort of you're that you're now in the position to be the shot caller for like what composer do you put on a project? What voiceover talent are you hiring? How are you building your team? And how are you building the processes at a studio in order to, you know, in this case, ensure that we're 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 we have like diverse hiring practices and requirements around diverse slates and things like that. Um, so that is like an amazing privilege and an amazing responsibility. Um, also, um, it is 
a seat at the table, right? It's a seat at the table creatively around building what a video game is. Um, like it's it's I'll sort of sing the praises of being in the <laughs> being an audio director for a second because it's amazing, but I don't come up through like the sort of traditional like studio background um which a lot of a lot of sound designers do nor do i come through the like music conservatory background i i'm like a an interactive artist basically i used to do like sound installations um and uh so the thing that drives me to work on games is that i love games i happen to be really good maybe probably not at at doing sound stuff um but I love games. So I consider myself like a game developer who works in audio rather than an audio person who, who works in games. And so being able to be sort of present at the creation of the ideas and the core ideas of what a game is, is like an amazing position to be in. Um, and it's, it's a vector by which I can help steer games to be, to be something that, that, I want them to be to to sort of make make the things that I want to see in the world, um, but as I said, it's a huge responsibility because it's also an opportunity to to you know take a crowbar and pry out space for folks, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and there is so much work to do, especially in audio. Um, in audio, it's it's really a case where we we have sort of twin vectors in order to really change the face of, of our discipline. We have an enormous gender inequality problem in audio. Um, and we just generally have a diversity problem in audio. Um, you know, it's, it's why I shaved my beard off. We need like, no offense to all the bearded dudes, but like, um, we need a little less. Um, but so it's, it's difficult. Every hiring decision is, is to be honest, is kind of agony um, mm -hmm. because every, every spot in game audio has a lot of meaning. Um, and maybe I'm putting like a little too much weight on it, but you know, there aren't that many sound designer positions at each studio. So every, it's like, especially for in-house positions. Right. And so it's a really, really difficult decision. Um, to to decide who to put on your team because it, every person on your team changes the voice of your game a little bit, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's a, a blessing and a curse, blessing and a responsibility. Um, but man, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, like I love being at the table to to figure out what games are. It's awesome. Love that. And for the for the rest of you, and also Caleb too, for from your previous experience. Considering most of the time, if you are on a project that has an audio director, odds are they're a white person. <laughs> like the odds are very high that that's the case. Have there ever been any sort of situations where you've had to kind of push for more diverse thought or any like diverse music or anything like that? Or has it generally just been accepted whenever you do have any of those ideals that you want to put forward in your music or sound? I think for me personally, I feel like I'm kind of neutralizing this. I haven't been in a position where <laughs> I've needed to. The, the The current project that I mentioned earlier would probably be the very first time that I've ever done anything that could bring about opposition. And I got, and it, it didn't. And even then, like I said, if I hadn't said anything, the opposition wouldn't have come, would have come when it was too late. So by then I wouldn't have even cared, but, um, but fortunately for this, um, I brought it to the forefront and it wasn't an issue. So. Nice. Anyone else? I know I'm making a bunch of faces over here. Um, I don't know. Like I, it's for me in general, I think, not even necessarily as a black person, but just as an artist, it can be very difficult to find out how much creative freedom you have and to like kind of bounce things back and forth. Mm -hmm. So like, 
I will say that, like, I don't know. I, as I go further in my career and as I work in kind of different environments, I do get a little bit more comfortable with like doing some stuff that's a little bit more out there. So I don't know. I, I, I don't even know if I should have started talking. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I would say in general, it, you know, there's probably kind of a dual thing, right? It's like, you're a composer and you're also black. And it's like, maybe both of those feet are like pressing down on some of my creative expression. So like in general, just the more open people can be, I think the better off. I mean, they get better, you get better music in your game. If you like, just let people do stuff, you know? And people are yeah. afraid to do that, I think. Yeah, that's yeah for this sure. is not an experience I have, but as an audio director, I imagine that like we're we're vaguely terrifying. <laughs> well, it's like you want to you want to like please the client, like we're the client, right? You want to like please the client, um, and so yeah, I I agree, John. Like giving that space, my sort of general ethos as an audio director is like have an opinion of like have a have a version of the thing in your head. Don't share that. Uh, because if you do, it it will often destroy the ability for the person you're working with to exceed that expectation. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I do that with composers, and I do that with voice with with voice talent as well. You can always fall back on the thing in your head if you're not if like you're like no, I like we're not finding it. Like I need to just get the thing. Um, but the like if you leave that space for the people you're working with to bring themselves and to surprise you, then that's just better because it's better than your wildest dreams. Um, but if you just, you know, if you let that out of the, out of your bag too early, like, you know, people are just going to do that because, you know, they want to, they want to please you. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think this is not necessary. Well, for, in my experience, this hasn't necessarily been a, black and game audio situation, but more of a composer in game audio situation that everyone kind of goes through. And I have to say that having worked on basically every tier, you know, of, of game development from like very high budget to very small budget, there is no correlation whatsoever um, between budget or, or status or whatever of the game and how much creative freedom that you have. Um, at least not that I've, I've experienced. Um, you know, once again with Mortal Kombat, it almost seemed like it was a goal for me to like, how can I just surprise them? How can I come up with something uh -huh. that's so. that's going to, you know, surprise them and be maybe very left field, but still make it in, still work for the game. And they were completely on board with every single weird decision that I that I came up with. Big action scene and it's just a, a pipe organ, you know, things like that. Um, but it, it worked and they were totally happy with it. One of the interesting opportunities, I think, that we have, um, not only with the coming generation, next gen, which is now or whatever you want to call it, but also just with our history uh, in game music, is that there really are a lot of musical genres that have not been explored. And a lot of them are Black American musical genres. You haven't heard much gospel in, in games. You haven't heard much spirituals. You haven't heard that much um, of, of different kinds of jazz. and. Uh, and of course, hip hop is only just now, you know, starting to get on the rise with the indie world and and uh, Miles Morales, like I mentioned earlier. So I see it as a great opportunity, honestly. And um, I'm hoping that directors can uh, be open to this and kind of think less in terms of like, well, here is how I envisioned the score going, and more in terms of, well, how does this work on an emotional level? How does this work on a mechanical level as well? Um, uh, that said, by the time that they've chosen the composer, they usually chose that composer for a reason. Uh, that reason usually being either their demo, their previous work or whatever. So there is only so much wiggle room that they can um, tolerate, uh, but it is definitely something to keep in mind. Nice, nice. So uh, question for you, Jasmine, specifically. I'm curious, considering you've been Vietnam, in Vietnam for a little bit now, and you have kind of a unique view on being overseas, right? When it comes to being yeah. in the game audio field and you've built your career primarily online as well. So I'm curious from your point of view, have you ever had to kind of 
hide or accentuate your blackness in any way? Have you felt you've had to in any way when you are kind of making this career happen online? Or have you just kind of gone with whatever feels right and it's worked out fine? I I generally have just gone with however I felt. I know, I guess when you say accept my blackness, you mean act more black? Mm -hmm. Because I've seen in a lot of spaces, Uh, people tend to kind of expect that. Okay. No, that's interesting. I, I'll definitely say, not from a game audio perspective, no, but just being in like an expat space has been interesting. But as far as being online, no, I've been able to continue just being my normal self online. I haven't had to overcompensate in any way. So yeah, I've, I've been fairly, I don't know. I feel like I mean, granted, you get most of, I believe most of the opportunities that you get as a composer come from in-person interactions. But I will say, even though it's definitely a lot harder to grow a career online, when you don't show your face or you go a long time without having to show your face, a lot of the things that I've heard that John, Will, and Caleb having to do, you don't have to do. That's probably, but honestly, it's because everybody automatically thinks you're a white male. So... So, you know, I don't have to hide because I, people already assume I'm status quo, you know? <laughs> so I guess that's, oh. I guess that's the upside to it. Um, I know I had, well, even this is tangential, but I remember I, when I was first starting and a guy knew, a guy knew that I was a woman. And so he was like, Hey, you know what you should do? You should like create this sexy girl persona that'll help you sell your music. And I was like, Ugh. But I mean, the fact that somebody like that's going to help me get to work to be a sexy, a sexy girl. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I know. Granted, that was early on. And that's and I've only had that happen once. Right. But I, I just threw up in my mouth like, why? What? what? You think that works? But, oh, yeah. No. But yeah, I haven't had to deal with any need to be extra black online. That's funny saying that. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, good <laughs> good so kind of a few questions kind of as we kind of circle to to the end i'm curious because you know we're, we're doing this panel we're getting some of your experiences thoughts your your kind of ideals out there but once this panel's over people will kind of go back to their regular lives they'll go back to experiencing the rest of gdc they'll think about their careers etc cetera, etc cetera. if you were to say what things people should do or what they should take away and what we should act on to make the space more diverse, more inclusive, more empathetic to your experiences and everyone else's, what would those things be? I feel like even if if a person, you know, if you feel like you want to be helpful, right? If you were to take even like 30 minutes out of your day to sit and think about what you could do, it doesn't even matter if you come up with a good idea, a bad idea, no idea. It really doesn't matter. You could, I mean, you could say the most awful thing after having done this 30 minutes. But I feel like <laughs> if you do this 30 minutes, I think that'll change like who you are when you approach someone. And even if you say something off color or whatever, I think they'll feel your effort and that will be meaningful, right? Like that doesn't mean that they're gonna embrace you and be like, oh, you're so wonderful. Like don't go in with that expectation necessarily, but just like put in the smallest amount of time and I think it'll have a dramatic impact on your interactions with people going forward, like honestly. I have a question. Is Is this question geared towards people trying to make their spaces more inclusive? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I think mine might be similar to what, what John said. I guess a couple. I, honestly, this is based off what Caleb said. Like, going to spaces versus expecting people to come to you. Because when you do do your research to try and put yourself into a position. But one thing, I was talking to somebody about this, where a lot of people, generally their spaces are, or the people that they interact with, are people that are very similar to them. And it's like, I feel like a lot of the time, the government or environments try to force diversity on people, but usually people tend to, I feel like most people tend to gravitate towards towards spaces that they're comfortable with, which is generally 
uh, comprised of people that look like them. And so one, one thing that I thought about was if people weren't put in positions to have to interact with people that are different from them, would they feel led to do that? Like, ah, I actually do hang out with a lot of people who don't look like me. Well, this space is open. Am I interested in going to see with how other people who, you know, being willing to open up my mindset to what other people may live their life or what their culture may be like. And so I guess I would definitely say, put yourself in a position to be uncomfortable, be okay with being uncomfortable, just so that you can expose yourself to what other people generally feel. You know, I, I think just practice trying to walk in someone else's shoes, mm-hmm. you know, it would definitely be a start. Yeah. And um, I guess also be open to like self-reflection. I think that's difficult too. Like being here in Vietnam, um, I realize that I have an immense amount of privilege. And I feel like for some people, depending on where they're coming from, they might move, they might come to another country and not realize that, that, oh, you have a lot of power that you didn't feel like you might've had back home, but you have it now. And are you aware of that? And also being able to look at some of the actions that you might do and go, oh, wow, that's actually, I'm actually not being um, conscientious of how my actions affect the people that live here or affect the people who primarily take up this environment and being okay with someone saying, hey, you do realize that what you're doing needs this. And rather than getting defensive, being able to internalize that and go, actually, they have a point. And this time I can do this the next time the situation arises. So I guess being open to being able to put yourself in uncomfortable situations and also being able to reflect on an event or an action that someone might bring to you. Like it's not, it has nothing to do with your character. It could just, this is just a way for you to, for your character to grow, I guess, in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, I would recommend that folks, one, like, in your hiring, change your hiring practices, like, yeah. like move to like, there are companies I've worked at that have requirements around diverse, having a diverse slate of candidates before they were hot, they will hire for a position. That's like a pretty, from a lot of people's perspective, that's a pretty large step to take, but I think it's yeah. an interesting way and a really effective way to drive, to drive sort of more diverse teams. This is putting a little bit, this is always like a little bit of a catch 22 because it's putting work on people, but like go into, go into spaces where you're not the, the majority and listen, right? Like come down into the, into the black and game audio discord, right? And listen and ask questions, right? It's okay. Like to ask questions. Um, And also, this is the putting work on people part, like, keep tapping, keep tapping people's networks, when you're feeling like, oh, like, I want a diverse slate of people, but like, I don't have those people in my network, keep reaching out and being like, hey, do you know, folks, like, just like, keep doing that, it is putting work on other people. And that's always like a little bit of a trap. But, um, you know, the outcome is positive. And I think it's, it's a great sort of muscle memory to build to like reach outside your networks and try to tap into those adjacent networks um, in order to find, to sort of broaden searches, broaden the amount of connections that you can make. Um, That would be my advice. Yeah, I, I know this is a horrible thing to bring up with only one minute left, but I'll try to go fast. So the two things I wanted to bring up, number one, there is a group called the Composers Diversity Collective. Um, you can literally go, I think, composersdiversitycollective.com uh, or .org. And it's an easily searchable database list of all of this talent of all different races, countries of origins, language, first languages, and whatnot. Um, it's basically Hollywood's way of saying there's no excuse anymore. <laughs> you can find us <laughs> <We're> here <laughs> or all over the world. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that we really should rethink how we're looking at entry level jobs in this industry. We really should rethink that because does it really make sense for an entry level job to require years of AAA experience? Does it make sense to require any kind of a demo at all? Because think about it, if they have a demo and it's 
outstanding, chances are it's someone who was able to afford all the greatest sample libraries, gear, whatnot. Maybe they already have some form of an advanced education in the field. And you're kind of already kind of um, re-accentuating whatever inequalities are already there. So perhaps maybe look more into soft skills. Um, how teachable does this person seem? Uh, yeah. How personable mm -hmm. are they? Yeah, I awesome. couldn't agree more. I think awesome. the, uh, the, to point at the work that's being done at Polyarch, um, there are several articles about how they've been, uh, uh, Chris and, and Stefan have been um, adjusting their hiring process to make them more inclusive and to try to lower the, those technical and sort of monetary barriers to entry. Um, it's really, really inspiring, something I've taken a lot of inspiration from. Um, so yeah, you'll get better employees that way. You'll teach Absolutely. them your studio's methods, and you've already guaranteed that they're going to be teachable people, likable people, yeah. rather than just like, well, uh, we're hiring for entry level, and we can save a couple of bucks if we hire someone who's actually mid level. You know, <laughs> you have to kind of stop that process. Yeah. John, did you have anything to add? I do. I really do. I know we're over, but I was gonna say like. The entry level thing I think is so huge because like, you know, I, you know, I went to the school that I could barely afford. That's a whole nother story. But I went to the school that I could barely afford and I came out of school and like I could have made music for games, but like there are so many people and, you know, I'm sure there are so many entry level positions that would not have given me a shot. And it's like I was capable, but it wasn't going to happen. And honestly, by the time like. I am honestly questioning whether or not I could get an entry level position right now, like sitting on oh, this 100%. panel. I'm like, <laughs> could I, like, I, I know that's preposterous, but I don't feel that it's preposterous. You know what I mean? So like, it's ridiculous. Just, just come on guys. Like, come on. <laughs> oh, okay. That's it. <laughs> awesome. Well, John, Will, Caleb, and Jasmine, thank you all so much for doing this panel. It is super appreciated, and I think it'll be a huge help to everyone out there. And thank you to GDC. Thank for you, Akash. Thank you, Akash. Yeah, thank you so much. You're a great moderator.